Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 56, The Great Outdoors, discussing great games to bring camping. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and as always, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG made for D, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Today, we're answering a question about what games to bring on a camping trip. I've also gotten in some more plays of Sorcerer and Raiders of the North Sea, and we're going to talk about some online digital gaming and a new weekly stream. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, or maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. All right, last week was a really busy week on social media for us. Like, I, th this was our busiest week as far as people commenting on stuff, liking stuff, and sharing it. So that was awesome to see. We got lots of great feedback and comments, and we're going to highlight some of those. So first off, I'm going to start with some comments on our GM Advice podcast. This goes back two weeks now. Uh, it was on running one-shots in public play games. Richard Ray Sanders writes, Nice, I'll be running a one-shot at a gaming event in the fall and haven't finished writing it. Some good points in the article. Really helpful. Thanks. Well, thanks, Richard. Now, up next, a comment on the Zombicide Invader unboxing video we put up on YouTube this Monday. Link9671 writes, Since I love board games so much, I love your vids. Keep up the good work. Oh, thanks, Link. I gotta say, that video is proving to be rather popular. Though not nearly as popular as our Gloomhaven FAQ, which just keeps growing and growing. It's like the Chia Pet video. It's insane. Uh, speaking of that, we've actually got people now sending us rule questions in the comments, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, I have no idea how to pronounce this name. Nezred Epivo? Nezred Epivo? Nezred Epivo? Nezred Epivo. Ezra Depp Evo, something like that. Apologize for the pronunciation. Got a question for you. If an enemy pulls me into melee range with their ranged attack with pull, I have retaliation activated for that round. Do I get to retaliate against that enemy? Well, yes, you would. Retaliation happens after the end of the attack, including the full effects from mm -hmm. that attack. Similarly, if you push an opponent with a retaliate away from you, it won't retaliate. Now, that is assuming the monster doesn't have a ranged retaliate ability. Now, a couple of days later, we got another comment from that same person asking another question. <laughs> Hi again. I'm at another dead end at my never-ending ruling clarifications. Does a random generated dungeon count as a scenario towards life goals that require some amount of different scenarios to be completed? Uh, nope, sorry, they do not. Actually, random dungeons are not actually part of campaign play. If you're playing a campaign, you do random dungeons as separate to that. Now, they're a great way to get gold and XP, and they're a really good option to play when you don't have your full group of gamers. That's what we like to do. And then that way you get to continue, you get to play without having to continue with people. But you can't actually progress in the campaign unlock anything you're not going to get any prosperity and to be honest what a lot of people miss is you don't even get to go to gloomhaven at the end of the scenario so you don't even get to go shopping do a city event or even level up if you've hit the right xp amount now we've got a bunch of comments on our last episode which was about finding rare or out of print games first off wayne's books who noted we were who we noted was a great source of out of print rpgs actually took the time to comment and say Three days ago, Wayne's Books writes, Hey, thanks for the call out. Always appreciate it. Great sourcing advice there. I have nothing to add. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for the comment, Wayne Books. Now, similarly, Mark Poles wrote to say, Hey, guys, thanks for the shout out. Mark is from the uh, shop on the Borderlands. No problem at all, Mark. It wasn't just Mark that appreciated Shop on the Borderlands being mentioned. Shane Ellswood writes, 
I hadn't heard of eight books, but it's good to see a British site in there. All right. Well, glad you may have found a new out-of-print game source to share. Now, Ron Bala gives another UK source in this comment. I buy a fair number of rare and old board games, mostly war games. Best places, in my humble opinion, are eBay, Noble Knight, BGG Market, Second Chance Games in the UK, mm. though not quite as much as the others, and good old Google searches. By the way, put your eBay searches on alerts so it notifies you by email when your searched item comes up for sale. I've waited a year or more for <laughs> rare games at a fair price on eBay quite often. Well, thanks very much for the comment, Ron. Also, I want to thank Ron for supporting our Extra Life efforts this year. Uh, he's the man behind the coffee exchange that's going to be providing us coffee and donuts for our gaming events. Now, Emmett O'Brien is looking for a specific game. He commented, let's see if I can find a copy of Blizzard of 77. Well, eBay seems to be about the only place actively selling this game, but... Because it's a somewhat niche game from a small market, you're probably going to be spending about $50 in the U.S. to get a hold of it, and that's with shipping for the most part. Interestingly, this game has come up a few times in our lobby over the episodes, <laughs> and it just did again, uh, as we do have a number of fans from the Buffalo area. Now, one final comment from someone also looking for a specific hard-to-find game, or rather game expansion in this case. Jerry L. writes... I've been looking for a copy of On the Line Pizza Box Football 2006 expansion for years. I have the base game and all of the other expansions. Seems like nobody ever has it for sale. If you could find a copy anywhere, I'd be ecstatic and grateful. You know what? This came up earlier in the week, and I tried to help Jerry out here. I really did. Like, I spent a couple of hours searching for copies of this Pizza Box football expansion. And at one point, I thought I had found a print-and-play version. If you go on the um, on the Lions Pizza Box football webpage, they have supposedly print-and-play free versions of all of the expansion packs from 2016 to 2019, except they actually start at 2017. Uh, in the end, I struck out. Like, I looked everywhere. I could not find a single copy of this used. I could find, like, Noble Knight has it as an item in their store, but it's sold out, right? And I found that at a couple places. So if anyone out there knows how to find the 2006 expansion for Pizza Box Football, give me a heads up and I'll pass that on to Jerry. Finally, I've got another comment from Emmett O'Brien. Uh, he just wanted us to know that he likes how we're splitting up the various podcast segments into different YouTube videos now. And I gotta say, based on the numbers we're seeing our last couple of weeks worth of videos, I don't think he's alone in that opinion. Well, indeed. So far, our YouTube views are suggesting that we have made the right move. Uh, so if you're enjoying the new format, keep watching and drop a comment to let us know. And it wouldn't help if you haven't already hit that follow button, too. Now, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We record here live Wednesday nights at 9.30 p at 9 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell in an off the books after show. So we're already talking, of course, about uh, the uh, Blizzard of 77. Blizzard of 77. Game. It, it, it comes up in our chat room on a regular basis, it seems like, just because we've got some, some Buffalo folks. And it really is one of those games that sort of uh, says you are a part of the East Coast. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of families from the East Coast had that game growing up and remember it fondly. Yeah, uh, so Major Kayla in our chat room does have a copy, but as far as I can tell, she's not willing to sell it. So if anyone is looking for a copy, if you give her the right price. Uh, the rest of the chat room I see is just arguing because uh, in the pre-show, I was talking about how I am drinking decaf coffee tonight, and everyone thinks that is very shameful. Uh, we've got a bunch of death before decaf chants starting in our lobby here. So, yeah. And she knows there are a bunch on eBay, but again, they are really overpriced. Yeah, like I mean, 50 like bucks, right? 50 bucks. They're thirty. They're thirty bucks, but there's about usually about twenty dollars shipping on most of them. Uh, and really, that game is worth about twenty bucks, twenty maybe thirty with shipping. Mm. Um, so I, I have a hard time seeing how you can justify, you know, spending fifty dollars on that game. But I mean, if it's in great condition and you really have those fond memories, uh, that's how eBay makes its money. That's true. <laughs> yeah, and Jeff is looking for Archipelago. I'll. Might be able to hook you up with that one later. I've definitely seen that one before. 
So what I want to know from the lobby is which of you go camping, because I think most of us do, even if it's not necessarily overnight, but at least go out and spend some time outdoors. At least I'll have a picnic or whatever. And when you do, what games do you bring? I'm trying to get Deanna is going to be in the chat. She's going to try to get your camping game suggestions. And once we get through our list, we'll be going through your list and see how they compare. We'll be back stopping by the lobby a few more times throughout the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. Now the best way for questions to get to us is to come through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Now today's question comes from Luke... Luke, like Shiras or Luke Shiras? It's like. Like Shiras. I don't asks, know if that's how it's pronounced, but L-I-K-E. All right. What are the best games for camping? Well, thanks for the question, Like. Obviously, this is going to turn into a game recommendation episode, right? We're going to sit there and list off a bunch of games we think are great for camping. But first, I'd like to take a bit to talk about what I think you need to take into account when packing games for a camping trip or really any outdoor gaming activity. Like where to find the cheapest hotels. You don't have to sleep outdoors. Oh, wait, this is just about the board games. Sorry. Yes. And if you have hotels, then you just listen to any of our other game recommendation episodes. <laughs> uh, if you are, you're going to, first off, you're going to want games that are small and portable uh, for a couple reasons. One, so they don't take up too much room and two, so they can be easily stored because you want to save space for important things like sleeping bags and clothing and cooking gear. And think about the fact that you're probably going to have to store the games when you get where you're going, like depending on the type of camping you're doing, if you're one of those uh, like provincial park campsites where you can leave your vehicle there, that's fine. You can get your vehicle and get the games out. But if you're doing some kind of interior camping, you're going to have to log lug those games with you on your portage on the way to your campsite. If you're parking somewhere and heading off on a long hike into the bush, you're not going to be wanting any extra weight in your pack. Or you're at least going to want to balance that weight yeah. against how much you really love and are going to be playing a game. Now, another thing you got to worry about is when you're out in nature, it's really easy to lose stuff. You don't want to bring any games with small or numerous components. I got to say, sometimes it's hard enough to find a drop piece in my basement. I can't imagine trying to find some of those copper cubes from Terraforming Mars and some underbrush. Yeah. So even travel games with their magnetic pieces may not be ideal as finding that little piece that fell is going to be harder in the long grass than it is on the little carpet in your van. Yeah, I totally agree with that, because to be honest, when we were building the list, I thought about putting travel Catan on it, and I specifically did not, because it's all these little pegs and roads, and you, though it's great for maybe playing in the car, it's small and portable, I don't think it's great for being outdoors. Now, one of the biggest things you have to consider when you're outdoors is that weather is a factor and can often be unpredictable. So you want to try to avoid games that can be easily ruined if they get wet dry, wet or dirty or fall in the mud. Uh, this is probably going to be one of the biggest factors for your games. When you do have a game that isn't water dirt resistant, make sure you have at least some way to pack it. So you're putting it into Ziploc bags or you're putting it into a plastic case, not just carrying everything in its cardboard box. So that classic Blizzard 77 game that we helped you buy earlier might not be your best choice for playing on a dewy campground morning. So if you are going in a winter camping, at least it'd be thematic. There you go. Now, extra protection can go a long way to protect a game. Uh, this is the one case where I'm actually going to recommend sleeving cards, and I probably would do it myself. Uh, the other thing you can look for, too, are coin protectors for cardboard. This is something I've seen people doing recently in the last couple of years, but I think it's brilliant. You can get coin protectors of various sizes to hold all your round and smaller tokens and chits. Um, consider laminating your player boards or reference sheets and board game boards as well. If they're thin can also be laminated or you can consider varnishing your boards. Like for example, uh, I had never heard of varnishing boards until I saw snakes and lattes does that with all of their games just due to people using them all the time. Right. Another place where you need to balance effort and fun is the fun you're going to have with that game worth the time and effort you're going to be putting into protecting it and possibly unprotecting it afterwards if you don't prefer to play it with that, that way all the time. Yeah, if you're going to put, uh, you know, pack Caverna and put 700 tokens together when you come home, are you going to want to keep them that way? Don't bring Caverna camping. <laughs> Though if you were going spelunking, it'd be appropriate. 
Now, speaking of boards for board games, flat spaces may be at a minimum when you're camping or outdoors. Uh, even if you do have a cabin, the size of the tables may be smaller than your game room at home or your dining room table you're used to playing on. So this may mean no place to fold out a board. This is where games with neoprene mats are great because neoprene mats are more forgiving. They can bend a little bit on the terrain, plus they're way more resistant to weather damage. Now, games without boards to me is even better though. Or games with small boards or just player boards. So there's no big central, you know, three by six board in the middle of the table. There's just a little player board. Or games, uh, for example, like Azul with a bunch of just like the little markets and your individual player boards are going to be better and fit better, say, on a blanket than something like Teo to walk in. You know, if you're lucky, you might have a picnic table. So if you know that in advance, you can plan. But you can't always count on that kind of space. And with a picnic table, you have to assume that it's going to be about as flat as the Himalayas. <laughs> Very true. I've seen some really bad picnic table. Uh, another thing to consider is game length. Uh, personally, for camping, I think short games are your best choice. I personally like longer games. But I have to think that most people are going camping to go camping. And playing games is just one of them probably going to like games are probably going to be fine, right? Like before going to, they're all going to sit down games in the middle of the afternoon while someone's cooking lunch on the campfire. The rest you're going to sit around and play a couple games because a camping trip is not likely the place where you're going to want to set up an eight hour game at Twilight Imperium. Now I know some people do board game camping weekends, but those are usually like a cabin trip, and to me that's not what we're talking about here. Board gaming at the cabin is not the same as board gaming in a tent. Because at that point, you're, we're talking about games to play outdoors. And if I was talking about games to play at a cabin, when you're going to be there for 24 hours locked in the room together, that is where you bring out Twilight Imperium. Or an escape room, perhaps. Now, yes. <laughs> so know your plans and also those of others. If it's a family camping trip, don't bring games that play best at four, when in reality, only two people are going to be playing games while other people prefer to read or hike or busy cooking dinner. Role-playing games that don't require additional components like dice can also be perfect for camping. And to be honest, dice aren't that bad. You just got to worry about possibly losing them. Look for games that don't need character sheets or don't require a lot of writing where you have to keep track of things. Uh, try diceless games or games that use a standard card deck are great alternatives to your standard traditional games. Though really what I like to see on camping trips are more improv and story-based games. Games that don't require a game master or moderator, and those are perfect for sitting around a campfire. If you do need character sheets, think about laminating them in advance mm -hmm. and using write-on wipe-off solutions. And then a solid dice tray with a lid can really help manage the rolls and, and keep the dice in one spot for everybody. So those are the things I took into consideration, or I think you should take into consideration when packing for a camping trip. Now to get on to some game recommendations based on those suggestions. So what follows is what I consider some of the best games to bring camping. Now up first, before we get into different categories of games, I do have to mention one game and that's Zentico. And I gotta say, this is totally self-serving because that's for you, those of you in the chat right now, because our giveaway for Zentico that's going on right now ends at midnight. In, I, what is that, five hours from now? 10, 11, 12, whoa, I'm terrible. Two and a half <laughs> hours from now. I don't know what I was saying. So that ends in two and a half hours. Whoa, I thought we were starting later. So for those of you lo watching live right now, today's your last chance to enter. Now, besides wanting to promote the giveaway, which is the reason I actually got to the whole camping topic today, I really do think Sentico was a great game for gaming outdoors. Uh, I was just literally playing this two days ago with Little G for the first time, and it went over great. She really liked it, picked it up right away. A couple weekends ago, we had it out at Sandpoint Beach in Leamington. Uh, we brought it to uh, the Lighthouse Park with my mom the other day, and we played some three-player games after playing some ping pong. This game just travels everywhere. Now, I have to admit, I haven't brought Zentico camping, but that's only because I haven't gone camping since getting Zentico. But Deanna is heading up to the Pinery this month with the girls, and one of the things she's planning on packing is our copy of Zentico. All right, well, now on to more games. We're going to break out the rest of the list down into categories, the first of which are card games. I got to say, there's probably nothing more versatile or portable than taking a couple decks of standard playing cards. You know, your usual ace, spades, cards. 
there are thousands of games that can be played with a single deck of cards, and there's even more that can be played with two decks. And there is such a variety in the types of games you can play with a standard deck of cards. Uh, they pretty much cater to all play pace from heavy gamers to light gamers. Now, while some play type of playing surface usually helps, Actually, most games don't require them. You can just play like from one hand into your other hand, keep tricks in your pocket if you have to, or make a pile off to the side. We literally keep a deck of cards in our glove box, so it, you never know when you could use a deck of cards. This really is the best option for everyone, gamer or not. It's rare that you're going to find someone who isn't willing to sit down and play some card game with you, or at worst, you can lay out your favorite Solitaire variant. It's not just for Windows 95 anymore. <laughs> Windows 95 teaches the weird, I'm like, I always liked the older versions. There was a clock version I liked, and there was one called King's Corners. I like that one. I never liked Standard Solitaire much. No one I'm surprised Solitaire doesn't come on people's phones. That just seems like it would have been an evolution. So on to some more gamer games or hobby board games or whatever we want to call them, some uh, designer games. I'm going to start with one that I normally wouldn't recommend, and that is Gloom. Now, if you toss out the box, Gloom becomes waterproof like literally waterproof, not even water resistant, because it is plastic cards. And this is an interesting game where you have a family and you are trying to make them have the most horrible and depressing things happen to them. And you win by having the most depressed family. It is the goth card game. Uh, the cards are plastic because when they're stacked on top of each other, it lets you see the cards below, the modifiers. It's, it's a really neat mechanic. It's not one of my favorite games, but I find the whole gloom theme fits in with the whole horror theme and telling scary stories at night. So it kind of fits well for the camping. Plus, the whole plastic cards aren't going to get damaged. The only thing I would say is don't play it if you're stuck in a tent on a rainy day. It's gloomy enough and you're depressed <laughs> that you're not enjoying. Don't play gloom on top of that. There you, go. you don't want to double down on the gloom. Then you might just play depression. And exactly. that's no fun. Up next, I suggest Sushi Go. Um, really, it could be Sushi Go or it could be any other drafting game that doesn't have a lot of components. Sushi Go is just the first one that came to mind for me. Now, you don't want Seven Wonders because Seven Wonders has a bunch of tokens and player boards. You want games that are just cards. And Sushi Go is one of those where you just have a deck of cards. You're going to sit there. You're going to pick the card you want. You're going to pass it. You don't really need a table. You could actually, like, pile your cards on your lap or next to you. Um, the only thing, though, is leave those cards, right? You should be all set for some outdoor drafting. No, absolutely. There's, there's just nothing wrong with going out, going down with Sushi Go. It, it seems to be a sort of a perennial favorite. A lot of people don't necessarily know it, but all those who do pretty much uh, seem to enjoy it for the most part. And it's a quick 15 minute play. So, for something a little heavier, uh, I'd suggest Lost Cities. This is two player only, though. There is a board game version that plays four, but I haven't played it, so I don't know what it needs. And yes, the original Lost Cities for two players has a board. But all the board is is a bunch of color-coded spots that tell you where to play the cards. So you don't act that. You just put the cards out. And do work. Um, um, I've actually played. We usually take the board out of the box. Uh, this is an interesting game where you're like Indiana Jones-style explorers checking out five different sites represented by cards in different colors. Uh, it's an old Rainer Nitzia game, so it's very math-based. Uh, you've got suits of cards in different colors and one to five of them. And you're trying to play your cards in order, but you only have a hand to so many cards. It's a lot of trying to remember what's been played and reading your opponents, see what they're going to do. It's actually a really good two player game. One of my favorites that I've been playing for years. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a fantastic game. Uh, again, it's a little on the older side uh, with a, a 99, but yeah. uh, it's very well regarded. And uh, again, 30 minute uh, light little fun game. Now, up next, we have abstract strategy games. These often have weather and dirt-resistant components that are perfect for outdoor gaming, as well as being easy to learn and quick to play. All right, for years, my number one go-to outdoor game was Hive. Uh, this is everyone's number one outdoor gaming game. There is a meme on Board Game Geek where people share pictures of playing Hive in the most ridiculous places, like scuba diving or on top of Mount Everest. Uh, this is a two-player tile laying game that is just a water-resistant bag and 22 Bakelite tiles. Now, the tiles represent various bugs and they're hex shaped, and the goal is to surround your opponent's queen bee tile. Each turn, you either put a new tile out or move one that's on the board, and each different insect moves a different way. So spiders go around the outside edge and grasshoppers jump. 
Now, not only is Hive weather resistant and damage resistant, it's also one of the best two player abstract games I've played. The rules are really simple to teach. The games are lightning fast, but it's one of those games that's quick to learn, difficult to master. Yeah. No, I've played this one a couple of times and it's great. And again, if you go on to Board Game Geek and look at the Hive, uh, the first images up right now are on a beach. Yeah. Uh, you scan a couple of, uh, a few little ways through and it's playing on a bed of leaves in a forest. There you go. You can literally, you don't need any sir, anything other than the world around you to play the game of Hive. And if you do go somewhere really dramatic and play Hive, take a picture of you, get on Board Game Geek and you'll get some thumbs and some geek gold. That's it's definitely go. a thing. Speaking of playing games in the grass, one of the games I have actually played in the grass quite a bit, and you can see this on the blog post for this, I shared a picture of it, is Onitama. Uh, this is another two-player abstract strategy game, but this one's much more chess-like, where players are attempting to capture the opponent's sensei piece or get their own across the board to the opposite starting side. Now, this is a game all about perfect information, where there are only five moves in play at all times, and after you make a move, it goes to your opponent, and then they get to use that move against you. It's a brilliant game. Uh, the board is a neoprene mat. Playing pieces are all plastic. All you got to do is laminate the cards or find card sleeves. They are kind of weird shaped, so I'm not sure if that's available. Leave the box and instructions at home, and you're all good for going outside. Yeah, and I think uh, just I, judging by the pictures, it looks like it's a standard business card size. No, so they're larger. They are? Oh, okay. Arrow, maybe. They might be tarot sized. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to say. And uh, it looks like that board could easily be used, uh, you know, do a neoprene version of that, print it up uh, easy. It is just... neoprene. It is, oh, it is neoprene. Excellent. It is neoprene. There yep. you go. Yeah, it comes rolled up in the box. Oh, perfect. There you go. Yep. Uh, just don't lose those little uh, uh, the little chess pieces because they are adorable. Yeah, they're, they're it's fair enough size. They'd be a little difficult to lose. Right. And they're br definitely brightly colored enough to not yep. lose in the grass. That was only Tama. Uh, last one, a game we talk about far too often, it feels like, and a new edition was just announced yesterday. That is Azul. Now, one of the things that's great about Azul, yes, it has boards. Yes, there's a marketplace board. Yes, they're personal boards. But the game takes a very small footprint because all these boards are separate. Now, it does require some surface to play on, but you can play on a blanket just as well. And you just need somewhere to put out the market discs. Like, technically, you could even hold on to your player boards and put them in your laps as long as you're careful. So I probably don't really recommend this. Now, the tiles aren't going to get damaged easily. The bag can be easily washed. The only components you really have to worry about are those boards. Now, for this, there are some fantastic options out there. I'm going to throw links into the show notes, but there are cloth player boards and wooden market tiles I've seen available on Etsy that are just, besides really functional, and not going to get damaged, or they're, they're fairly waterproof. They just look beautiful. Like they're better looking than the originals. Yeah, no, absolutely. For the hardcore as well players, I recommend going uh, with like a neoprene mouse plaid mm -hmm. player boards and market. Uh, if you go to uh, Board Game Geek, there are some fantastic files there that you can uh, get get printed up. Um, just some gorgeous table mats and mm -hmm. things for Azul, already pre built for you, ready to go in the file section of Board Game Geek. It's you. Uh, oh, yep, sorry. No, that's you. No, it's not. Wow. Oh, I'm like, I don't that? know what just happened there. I was drinking and I scrolled <laughs> and I'm bad. Sorry, we have one more abstract strategy game. I'm terrible. Uh, travel Quirkle or regular Quirkle or Quirkle Cubes. The only reason I'd say Travel Quirkle first is it's smaller. It's a little bit more portable, though not much. It's just a little smaller. Um, all versions of Quirkle are compromised of a bunch of wooden tiles or cubes and a bag you draw them from, and that's it. The only other thing you need is a way to keep score, and nowadays we just use our phones. But if you didn't want to have your phone with you, which is fair, if you're going out camping, you might want to disconnect, bring a laminated score pad. That would work just as well, um, and it will be more weatherproof anyway. Uh, Quirkle, we talked about before, it's a Scrabble-like tie laying game that plays up to four. It's simple enough my kids can get it, but adults love it as well. Yeah, and uh, there's just so many uh, easy ways to play it. People seem to love it. You know, it's great. So next up, social deduction games are great for big groups and playing around a campfire. All right, in the dark, around a campfire, out in the woods, is probably the perfect place to play a game like Werewolf. And I got to admit, I'd probably even play a werewolf in that particular situation. Because I got to say, the theme just fits really well, right? Like, you're out of the woods, 
it's dark and one of you is murdering someone during the night. That's what this game's all about. Uh, there are other versions. Uh, you can go with Mafia, though I don't think it fits as well. Uh, or you could do Do You Worship Cthulhu. But I gotta say, in the woods, I'd want to play Werewolf. Like, I am not normally a fan of these games, but this is the one setting where it just works, right? It just, it, you're immersed into that setting. You're probably, it's a casual game night anyway, and who cares if you get eliminated right away? It just means you get to eat more s'mores while everyone else is playing. Uh, what's great about Werewolf is you can play huge player counts. Like, you can probably get the entire campsite involved in a game of Werewolf. Yeah, no, Werewolf is, uh, and games like it are, are fantastic for this. And again, you know, if you're having adult beverages around the campfire, it doesn't matter, you know, mm -hmm. I, and until, unless you are too inebriated to enjoy the, the experience in general, you're not going to be too inebriated to play Werewolf too. <laughs> no, not likely. You may not play well. But yeah. <laughs> I was Werewolf. Uh, up next is a game called Spyfall. Now, this is a word-guessing game. That doesn't require any type of table or board, which is why I threw it on the list. Now, I personally think Codenames is a better version of this kind of game where you're trying to guess words. But you don't want to bring all the cards of Codenames. You may not have a place to lay them out. I think Spyfall is actually better for a camping trip. Because all you got to do is sleeve or laminate those cards and leave the box at home. Now, this is a unique social deduction game where everyone is given a location card that says where you are, except one player. Their card says Spy. Players then ask each other leading questions to try to root out who the spy is. So you don't want to, like, if the thing's airport, you're not going to say, when's your flight get in? Because the spy is going to know you're at the airport and be able to mix in. Because the spy is sitting there listening to what everyone's saying and trying to blend in. With the right group, what's fun is on those location cards, they give you a role. Like if it said airport, it might say stewardess, whereas someone else might say disgruntled customer. So there is an actual role-playing element that can be part of the game. And to me, that's when the game really shines. But you got to make sure you have players that are buying in if you're going for that aspect of the game. And if you have a larger group, Spyfall 2 plays up to 12 players okay. and uh, has another extra function where there are, you can actually have up to two spies at each location. Okay. So, uh, and uh, there are people who have taken it out and literally just put the bag, the cards in individual Ziploc bags yeah. to play with. It's that easy. At to, each location, yeah. you shuffle the bags yeah. so you don't know which location you have, go. That's actually how I played it. Someone brought it out like that. Right. I got to admit, I never played Spyfall 2, so it's cool to see that they, they made it a little bit more verbose, the bigger, fit more people. Extra spies, cool. Uh, up next, Skull and Roses, or now it's known as just Skull, but for years it was called Skull and Roses. Uh, this is a bluffing game that's played with a set of 24 coasters, or more if you can find sets, that plays up to six players. But again, can be increased because every set you bring allows another six players and you can add any number of sets. Uh, this is the kind of game you can actually make your own at home with any sets of coasters, as long as you have three that are the same, which is roses in the set normal and one that's different, but that are all the same on the back. So you can't tell them apart. So normally you get three roses in a skull. Each round, you're going to play one of your coasters face down until someone decides to bet. And that is the person's betting how many coasters they can flip around the table without revealing a skull. Once someone's bet, it then continues around the table and the next person can outbid the last person. So if I'm going to flip three, the next person, I'm going to flip four, I'm going to flip five, I'm going to flip six. Eventually people are like, go for it, you flip six. And then they try to flip six things. If they flip a skull, they lose. If they flip uh, a rose all the way, if they manage to get to their bet, they win. You do that twice and you win the game. This is actually a really neat game. And the thing is, you don't need the table. Like, I'm saying put it on the table, but you can just, like, put your cards, your coasters in your left hand or your opposite hand or put them in the floor in front of you. I have actually played this a lot of times with groups of um, full people, and it still goes over well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, there's actually a great little printable reminder card, so you don't even need to bring uh, anything. Like, the, the printable one-page reminder card that you can pass around before you play and make sure everyone knows or have carry with you. Um, so, you know, you just need the the cards and the, and a piece of paper and you're good to go. And like I say, if you can go, you can play this with beer coasters, whatever, as long as you have, as long as the backs are the same, so you can't tell them apart. You just need three of one suit and one of another. And that was skull. Up next, Hanabi deluxe. Now I'm saying deluxe because the original Hanabi is a card game. And actually, I do kind of recommend Hanabi as a card game to bring. But if you can, if you bring the Deluxe Edition, those cards are replaced with Mahjong-like tiles. I think they're Bakelite. They might be plastic. And while these tiles are, of course, much more damage and weather resistance and thus better for camping. Now, the disadvantage to these tiles, though, is you do need a surface to put the tiles on. 
But thankfully, it doesn't have to be that big. All you need is a spot to stack five little tiles in front of each player. Um, Hanabi players as a group are trying to play their hand of tiles by color in numeric order, which sounds really simple. But the trick is you can't actually see the values of your own tiles. It's a very unique game. You kind of have to play to really rock. And then once you do, you're like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, no, there's a, a Hanabi Deluxe 2 coming out this year. So it's uh, so, newer. From newer what I understand, it. that adds an expansion. Ah, uh, okay. Something that was available standalone. I did see that. I couldn't recommend that because I've never tried uh, it. Sorry, yes, uh, the Master Artisan expansion. Uh, six six unique tiles. Okay. So, so next up, we have a few dexterity games that could be worth packing for a journey to the great outdoors. All right, this is becoming our new Azul because we mention it every damn podcast anymore, and that's Go Cuckoo from Hava, right? I've talked about this one. Uh, the thing with this, you do need a bit of a flat surface, but really the footprint's like as big as the tin, as long as you can find something to put that tin on. Um, there is a small worry of losing eggs that fall out of the nest, but to be honest, these are bright white and they're larger than marbles, so they should be safe in an all but the densest brush. Uh, we've mentioned it before, this game's super easy to teach, fun for gamers of all ages, fun for non-gamers. Plays a wide range of player counts. Uh, the box thing says play five, but we played six and seven. You just distribute the eggs evenly. I, I literally bring this game everywhere, and I would have to be camping. Yeah, no, we played uh, at uh, Extra Life. We played it on top of a banker's box mounted loosely on a chair. And, you know, it was you know, we made our own sort of miniature flat surface, and it worked just fine. Yeah. All right, another dexterity game that I don't think we've ever talked about before, and I don't think many people even know I own, because I don't bring it out often, is a game called Click Clack Lumberjack, or TikTok Woodman, depending on the printing you get. Um, what's more fitting when going camping than a game about cutting down trees, right? Well, assuming camping, I think I realize some people go camp in deserts and stuff. But I think I'm in the middle of the forest, so I'd want to set up this plastic tree it's really tiny footprint, even smaller than Goku. You just need somewhere to stack up the silly little tree and you get a little plastic axe and you're trying to tap the tree and knock off pieces of bark. And you get one point per piece of bark, but if you knock any of the cores off, they're minus five points. And then there's a bonus rules where some of those pieces of bark have bugs on them, which are little stickers on the inside and they give you extra points. It's super simple. It's silly, but actually quite fun. Uh, one, if you got drink on, no one's going to take this seriously. Someone's going to too hard uh it, it's a silly fun game it, it's actually one i'm thinking i gotta bring to easy mode the next time we have an event just because i never think to bring this one out and and just to sort of uh give a little bit of history on this game it started with tiktok woodman first in yep. edition then second edition then click clack lumberjack and now it has been re-implemented again by bling bling gemstone yes so yeah now now you're hitting like a stalactite trying yeah. to get gems off it i don't know so there's a whole lot of different versions out there, but essentially they're all the basic, same basic gameplay uh, that you're looking for. So yeah. if you're going spelunking, you want to bring um, Bling Bling Gemstone. There we go. And that was, <laughs> uh, and that was Click Clack Lumberjack. Now next up, telling stories around the campfire is a campsite tradition. So why not turn it into an actual role-playing game? So as I mentioned before, you here you you're probably you could, but you're probably not going to play D and D. Right, you're not going to want something, especially with maps and minis. You don't want to bring a full set of polyhedrals, and you don't want to have to be writing down all kinds of notes and keeping track of hit points and stuff like that. We're what I'm suggesting you bring are more storytelling games, more improv style games that have less physicality to them. And the number one game I'm going to recommend is a game I finally got to try at Queen City Conquest, and that's For the Queen. This is an improv leading question based role playing game that's made up of only one deck of cards. You literally don't need to know anything about the game before you open it. You learn the rules to play as you open the game for the first time by reading off the cards one by one. There's no game master, there's no moderator, uh, there's zero prep. I, I got to play this at QCC and thought it was one of the best improv story game experiences I've ever seen. Uh, this would be awesome to play while sitting around a campfire. Uh, I probably keep it so one player just holds the deck and just reads off the, the cards to the other players instead of passing it. That way there's no chance of dropping the cards, but that's about the only change I'd do if I was sitting around a campfire. Yeah, no, I mean, it's hard to go wrong with that. Uh, it's not one I've played yet, but uh, we've talked about it several times here and everyone uh, seems to either love it or look forward to playing it. 
Now, Fiasco is another zero prep, no GM, no moderator required game. Now, this does require a bunch of D6s, but just D6s in black and white. And I got to say, thankfully, those are pretty abundant. Like, I have hundreds of either white and black D6s around the house, so I wouldn't be worried about losing a couple. Now, in Fiasco, you're playing people with powerful ambition and poor impulse control, where things can not only possibly go bad, but they will go terribly bad. It's going to be horrible. Now, one of the cool things about Fiasco, though, and one of the reasons I had to put it on this list, is there are different setting playlists. And there are some that are just perfect for camping. Uh, there is one specifically called Camp Death, where you're basically playing out the slasher film in the middle of the woods. Like, what better for sitting around a campfire? No, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's uh, dice are not a real big issue. It's easy to find. I mean, uh, just a piece of Tupperware that you've you know used washed out after cooking or you know food you brought stuff you brought in food. Dice dice are not really ever an issue. So uh, if that's all you need, go to town. All right, here's one that is interesting to me. I, I found this recommended by someone else. So this is, uh, this is, you're, this is coming to you secondhand. Uh, this is The Extraordinary Adventures of Baron Munchausen, a game of wages, wine, and competitive lying. Now, I'm sad to say I haven't played it myself, but man, this sounds perfect for playing around a campfire. Because in this game, players sit and improv and tell a fantastic story. And it's based on story prompts that are in the book. And you tell the story, and then the next player has to try to tell another story to one-up the last person. And attempt to trick the other players, wagering a and putting out a falsehood. Like, oh, no, there's no way the Baron of Britannia was there, because at that time, I know he'd be in his seasonal home. And then the original storyteller has to either come up with an excuse and spend one of their own tokens, or swallow their pride, and then go, oh, you were right, he was there, and then incorporate that new truth into the story. Like, this is dice list, GM list, no goal, no prep. There's over 200 scenarios in the initial book, and it's just all about bullshitting and bragging. Oh, I forgot. Bad mo. <laughs> no, I have to all say. Lying and bragging and outdoing each other. Yeah. No, I have to say, this one This one, I would love to play sometime. This this sounds right up my alley. The uh, the, the telling tales, uh, you know, based obviously off the, the movie and, the, and, and books is just a fantastic concept. And... Uh, could be really fun with the right people. And that was The Extraordinary Adventures of Baron Munchausen. All right, my final story game RPG, if you will, this is more of a story game so you don't actually play a role, is Once Upon a Time. Um, this is, you start off with, a, with literally saying Once Upon a Time and then start telling a fairy tale. You're doing this based on the cards in your hand. And you have a bunch of cards that are just um, like fantasy tropes, right? It'll say elf or gnome or magic beans or things like that. And you're trying to incorporate the items in your hand into your story. Try to drive your story a unique card. And I don't remember if you get goals, but it's... So you're trying to get the story, play all your cards and get it to the end. The thing is, other players can interrupt by playing their cards. And then they start weaving the story towards their own ending. So there is a winner in this game. With the right group, and I got to admit, you do need the right group. I have had a fantastic time playing this game. The thing is, remind players that it's about telling a good story and not about winning the game and playing your cards as quick as possible. This game is falling completely flat with some competitive board gamers. Uh, that's understandable. You really have to be in the storytelling mode. Uh, a bunch of actors sitting around playing this, mm. uh, this game would be fantastic. All right. So here are a few other games that didn't really fit into the above categories that still could be great for your camping getaway. All right, this one, as soon as I started writing this article, the first thing I thought of was Roll Through the Ages. Uh, this is a Civ building roll and write. Uh, it's an early roll and write before roll and writes took off like in the last couple of years. But it uses a wooden pegboard to keep track of all your stuff, which is really cool, and a scoring pad to keep track of what you built and get your final score. All you got to do is laminate a couple scoring sheets and you've got a pretty much weatherproof game because the dice are even wood in this one. Uh, this is a quick sub building game, plays up to four players, really cool, really nice looking play boards, and it packs down really small. Uh, core game is decent, but what you want to look up actually is the print and play version of the late Bronze Age expansion. And all that gives you is some different rules and a different scoring sheet that adds a new level to the game. All right. Well, uh, I'm learning roll, roll uh, I'm learning uh 
the Through the Ages games right now on Board Game Arena. Haven't <laughs> uh, haven't played the Roll and Write version though. Uh, but peg, speaking of pegboards, you know, and right back to when we were talking about cards, you know, just uh, that there's a lot of card games that use pegboards as well mm-hmm. to to score, so uh, they can do double duty. Very true. And that was Roll Through the Ages. Up next, I've got a game I know Sean's been playing a lot of Vigley, and that's Can't Stop. Uh, the thing with this one is the components are basically a plastic board, some plastic pylons, and some dice. So everything's plastic. Everything's waterproof, I would assume, if not water, re- at least water resistant. I would think waterproof. Um, stuff's easy to clean. The only problem with this is the board is not small. It's it's a large board, but it's made of hard plastic. So I don't think you really need to have a flat surface. It kind of is a flat surface on its own. Uh, this is a classic push your luck game. Plays up to four people. Dead simple to teach. Plays in about 30 minutes. I have seen a number of people online who have actually made their own versions who have gotten rid of the large board and replaced it with other alternatives like cloth. And that might be a good alternative for camping as well. Absolutely. And not only that, you can get away with really, if you know the game well enough, doing it on a piece of paper with a pencil. I mean, you don't need a board game for this. You really just need the dice and everything else is just making the game easier to play. That was Can't Stop. The last game on the list for today, this is 22 game recommendations today, is Bananagrams. Uh, this is a word game that's a bit like Scrabble without the board. Uh, it'll appeal to fans of Scrabble and other word games. It doesn't require a pencil or paper at all because there's no actual scoring like where you're calculating points. Uh, the goal is to complete your own word grid with the letters you have. So it's basically, um, you're basically making like jigsaw puzzles, right? Or not jigsaw, crossword, sorry, crossword puzzle style stuff. Uh, if you get sick of the base game, too, there are a number of variants. Some of the game even more online. Now, the components in the uh, bordergrams, banana, excuse me, bananagrams are pretty much perfect for camping because they're plastic and they're in one of those zip-up water-resistant bags. Yep, absolutely. So, we're checking back into the lobby now to see if there are any other great game recommendations for camping. So, May Suggins agrees, love Lost Cities. Yeah, she's the one that actually, I can't remember, I think she's the one that played with Deanna originally, and Deanna's the one that got me into it. I used to meet her on her lunch when she worked downtown at the library, and we would go to the coffee exchange and play Lost Cities. So, that's that's how long ago it was. <laughs> Very solid game. And, I, um, yep. Now, May Kayla has mentioned a Michael's photo storage box specifically the Recollection Color Photo and Craft Keeper to hold card games. And these are awesome for killing boxes of card games. Really, uh, really great for a camping uh, packing. That's cool. I, I, I'm i assuming those are the ones she had in the kit they had in their trunk. Because, man, yeah, those things were brilliant. They, they were actually sealed up, so I'm pretty sure they'd be pretty close to water. Again, water, at least water resistant, if not waterproof. Those were beautiful. There was a ton of room to put those in. All right, uh, so next up we had, uh, for storytelling, Jeff Seuss mentioned Dread. No dice, but Jenga, and also Ten Candles. Uh, Dread, I can see. Uh, you do need that surface, and you need a more stable surface than, say, like, Goku requires. But if you've got a picnic table or something, you can set up a Dread thing on. I personally never played Dread, so I didn't want to throw that on the list, but it did come up strongly recommended. Um, Ten Candles I've heard fantastic things about. The only thing, though, is I thought 10 candles, the whole thing is you played until the candles went out, and you may not want to use real candles out in the woods. There is a concern with an open flame there. Yeah, no, absolutely. There are a lot of fire bans these days uh, as the environment and uh, how we treat it changes. Uh, And yeah, I have to say the Jenga thing is concerning to me because, again, you need a flat, stable surface for that. Uh, would be great if you had the cabin or, 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 you know, you do, you had good new uh, picnic tables, yeah. but, uh, I wouldn't want to try and play that on one of those 20 year old picnic tables that, uh, <laughs> seen some life. Uh, now Jeff Seuss is also saying a penny for your thoughts went over well for him, similar to Baron Munchausen and everyone is wow. John would be a good one. Okay. Penny for your thoughts is weird. Cause I thought that was about people with mental problems where you're, discussing things from your childhood and then the people on your left and right tell you what actually happened and you pick between them. That seems very different than Baron Munchausen to me. Um, 
that's what I remember. A penny for your thoughts. Maybe I'm thinking of the wrong game. Everyone is Dawn came up on everyone's camping RPG recommendation list I could find out there. I got to admit, again, I haven't played it. I I haven't done a lot of story gaming. I'm kind of new to that. I back in the day we would have brought Warhammer with metal miniatures camping. So the, those were our role playing roots. There you go. Now, Jeff mentions in Fiasco, you can pre-generate your roles and have them on a sheet, crossing them off as you use them. I Again, I thought in Fiasco you need the white and the black dice because you handed people white or black dice, depending on if you thought they got in the scene positive or negative finish in the end. Maybe I'm remembering that wrong. So maybe that's something you can do with just a thumbs up, thumbs down. Because I remember you collect all your dice at the end, and then you roll them to see what happens to your character at the very end. So I don't know. if There's, a, there's probably a way to, to represent it. I'm sure there must be. Uh, Mage Gello is saying Camp Death was her first fiasco. Yeah, yeah that was the one that I, I specifically saw. I thought would be perfect for playing around a campfire. Yep. It was a, it was a thing of beauty. Everyone, everyone but one died, and he wandered off into the woods after he lost his twin brother, best friend, and the girl he had a crush on. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like fiasco. Uh, Cypher2247 was wondering if uh, Cards Against Humanity was mentioned. No, intentionally not mentioned. <laughs> We are we are not generally big fans I of. Not uh, recommend the game ever right. anywhere. There there are much better options if that's the if you're looking for for card games of that type. Uh, apples to apples is it is your the the base one yeah that's yeah. the 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 one where you you can if you want to be rude you can be rude on your own you don't need someone else to write bad jokes <laughs> for you so you don't have to feel guilty. There you go. Uh, and uh, he was asking if we'd mentioned about Sushi Go, and yeah, we had mentioned that earlier in the show. It was yep. one of our first recommendations. Was definitely Sushi Go is good to good to bring. Uh, and Cypher2247, again, is mentioning he had 2 by 4 size Jenga for bonfires. Oh, that there you work. go. There you and go. when you it falls, you just light the fire. You size it, you size it up enough, and it, everything becomes leveled if you get a big enough stick. Uh, now, for the trip to the campsite, I do have a game I can recommend. The problem is everyone hates the name because I didn't realize the name was taken. I wrote a role-playing game called The Fantasy Trip. Sorry, A Fantasy Trip. Steve Jackson wrote a role-playing game called The Fantasy Trip, and I didn't Google the name of my game. I do have to rename it, but right now it's still called A Fantasy Trip, which uses I Spy as the resolution mechanic when you play a fantasy dungeon crawl on the way to your camping trip. I was going to throw a link in there, but every time I do, everyone gets really upset about the fact that I stole Steve Jackson's name, which was totally unintentional. Uh, and then Midge Kayla and Jeff Seuss are both agreeing eagerly that lasers and feelings uh, and uh, some of John Harper's other stuff would be uh, great options at the campfire. Yeah, personally, I'd go with Rocker Boys and Vending Machines, but that's uh, just because I love Cyberpunk. There you go. All right. Well, that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. If you got a question for us, remember, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com website and find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, as I mentioned in our last segment, today is the last day to enter our Zentico giveaway. Now, this only applies to those of you here joining us live on Twitch. I'm looking at you, Lobby. You can find the review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just stroll over to the bottom to find the entry form. And don't forget to use the code we just dropped in the chat for five bonus entries while you're there. Now, finally, I just want to take a minute to thank everyone who entered, shared, and helped promote this giveaway. I realize it wasn't the most well-known game out there, but this is something I'd love to do more often is to be able to give away games and reward our viewers and listeners. And in the future, the more people who enter and the more interaction they get, the better the odds are of getting us something a little more well-known to give away. Because I can go to publishers and be like, look how many people entered our last giveaway. We want to give away your game. So thank you, everyone who did enter, shared, help promote, thumbs up, help get the word out. Absolutely. Now, 
we've changed our start time for our live podcast recording. Starting with today's episode, if you noticed, we will now be going live on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern, giving it a few minutes for people to roll in after they see the uh, notifications, and uh, we'll probably actually start the show proper around 9.15 every day. That sounds about right. Now, I'm hoping this earlier starting time will allow more people to join us for our live show, and I gotta say, based on our chat today, it looks like this is working. Right. Now, speaking of live shows, we've got a new stream to announce. After a mostly successful test last week, we're going to start living, uh, live streaming digital board game plays on Thursday nights. Uh, this is also going to be starting at 9, 9 p.m. Eastern on average. We're going to try. Uh, you can join Sean and I and occasionally Deanna as we play digital board games through sites like Board Game Arena, Steam, and other online gaming platforms. That's not what I want. I want to go here. Uh, so I just randomly press buttons and things don't do what they're supposed to do. Anyway, ding, ding. And now, Tabletop <laughs> Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at the thetabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. So I got this is the same place it fell apart last week too. There's something wrong with that one transition or yeah, something. Yeah, I got to figure out what's going on there because I thought I went through and checked things today and I'm, I don't know why they all seem to work when I tested earlier. And what are we playing tomorrow? I don't know yet. I honestly have no idea. Not Terraforming Mars on Steam, which we'll get to in a minute. <laughs> uh, so this week for gaming, uh, not a lot of physical games this week. Uh, I only played two games that are both night. Uh, Mike Murphy. Um... Uh, name people might recognize if you watch our Zombicide Invader unboxing again. Thanks, Mike, for giving that 55 pounds of game boxes for me to take a look at and then you to take away and make me all sad they're gone. Um, Deanna joined us for the first game of the night on Monday. Um, so it was me, Deanna, and Mike, and we played Raiders of the North Sea. Uh, this was Mike's first time playing, and I gotta say he really enjoyed it. What I thought was interesting, though, because... Deanna and I have now played this quite a few times, uh, was seeing his enjoyment of the game grow as the game went on, as he started to grasp exactly how some of the mechanics work. And like the best example of this is, is their whole take a play a meeple, take a meeple mechanic, take a, take a guy, play a guy mechanic. And it, it was the first time he couldn't actually take the two actions he wanted because both had people. And he's like, but I can't place the, but I can't take, ah. And I'm like, oh, it's brilliant. I can see he got it, right? Um, by the end of the game, he specifically commented on how much he enjoyed that mechanic and noted how many more games should use it. And I got to say, I share that sentiment. I, I can't believe that hasn't spread. Like worker placement spread everywhere. This whole take a meeple, place a meeple, take a meeple just hasn't really gone any further than that game. I, I say, I, I'm willing to bet the developer of this game had to have worked in a convenience store or something, you know? <laughs> Take a penny, leave a penny. Maybe. <laughs> it just seems, just anyone who spent enough time in a convenience store would just think of that automatically. No, Architects of the West Kingdom does something different. I don't know what it does. I know it's worker placement. Uh, back to Raiders, though, it is a, it's a pretty quick game. Uh, once we finish that, we realize we still have some time left. Uh, Deanna did excuse herself to go work on something else, so it was just the two of us. And I used this opportunity to show him Sorcerer from White Wizard Games. Now, last week, uh, we talked about playing Sorcerer three players with Sean and Deanna and I. Uh, and I got to say, and I know Sean agrees, it was not an optimal way to play that game. Uh, you can watch that three-player game. It's up on YouTube. It was okay. Not great. Uh, got to say, since then, I've been looking forward to playing it again with two players. Yeah, we, we, we've talked about a lot last week about how just three players just doesn't work. The Battle Royale format for Sorcerer should be avoided. Now, this was Mike's first time seeing the game, and I got to say it went really well for a first play of a brand new game. Now, Mike, I know, has quite a bit of experience with similar dueling games like Magic the Gathering, and I think that really helps when trying to learn Sorcerer, because he picked up the basic mechanics pretty quickly. Uh, the teach was surprisingly quick, and we were deep into playing in no time. Yeah, I have to say, if, if you... Play, have played card games, you know, I've got a history in Magic the Gathering, Vampire, and, and various other uh, competitive card game, collectible card games. While this isn't a collectible card game, it plays very much like one, so. Right. And the thing is, if you don't have that background, though, wow, like Sorcerer has a steep learning curve. 
And we've said this every time I talk about Sorcerer. It's the one thing about that game that may kill it. Uh, because not only learning the mechanics, but learning how to implement them well and understanding the various card interactions takes some work. And that magic helps, but there's still a lot there. Because this is a game that rewards system mastery. So despite that, Mike kicked my butt in our game Monday night. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. And I'm wondering, they talk about using um, sort of a random... Uh, uh, starting off with with just random de deck assignments, mm -hmm. uh, I wonder how much uh, the drafting changes things. Uh, you know, as as every it goes time we on. played, we drafted, but it's basically random because we don't know what we're drafting. Well, yeah, that that's part of, that's <laughs> part of it. It's, but at some point, you're it's going to become you know where you you want yes. a certain set of decks, and I'm, I'm going be, to be interesting to see how that changes things. I gotta say, at this point, I've now played enough. I have favorite decks. I, I can definitely say that much. There's definitely characters I prefer. Um, I don't, I find the one that lights things on fire seems to be underpowered. I'm sure they're all, or I just don't use it well. Uh, I found the vampire really neat, and I hate the one with the bugs. So the other one's all right. I, and, I, yeah, I've, I found the one who lit things on fire had a lot of potential, but I think it was matched up with another wrong deck. So I think it needs to be matched yeah. with the right deck. That could be it. Now, the main thing that this did reaffirm, though, playing Sorcerer with Mike, was that it is good, right? Because after that three-player game, we were kind of like, wow, yeah, it was okay. Like, no, Sorcerer two players is great. Like, it's it's really good. Like, this game only took us about an hour, was extremely tense. I, I think Mike really enjoyed it. He's actually in the chat right now. Uh, he's been commenting that he liked the mana rules for Sorcerer. Um, he noted he may be looking up to pick, a, pick up a copy. So, as I've said before, when I teach someone a game and their response is, I need to buy this, I have to say that's a win. Well, and an hour sounds like a delightful game length for that. Yes. Three hours was not. Yeah, I got to agree. Uh, and that's it for physical game. Only the only the two. Thanks, Mike, for coming over Monday or else I'd have nothing to talk about tonight. Um, I did want to talk about some digital gaming this week, though, because we've been doing quite a bit in the last week. And it's something we actually have been doing ongoing. Actually, since we started this podcast, we talked about playing on board game arena before and that's something that hasn't stopped it's just something we stop talking about every week but the big thing is we mentioned this in the announcement section is we're going to start trying something new and that's live streaming digital plays of games on thursday nights again uh we're aiming for 9 p.m start time we tried this for the first time last week and i gotta say it went pretty well i gotta admit it wasn't perfect because one of the first things that failed is our goal was to launch with terraforming mars the Steam version, which, oh my god, that game is beautiful. Like, I kind of want to show this game off. It's still only in early access, but man, it's looking great. But unfortunately, the way Steam works, even though they have a family setting, and I set up a family, and Deanna's part of my family, and I can share Terraforming Mars with Deanna, we actually can't both play at once. I gotta say, I think this is ridiculous for this style of game, because here, here's a huge disadvantage to digital board games over the real thing. With a real board game, only one player needs to own the game. And not only by owning the game, I can play with my family. I can bring it out and play it with 500 different people in Windsor with my copy of the game. I can't play it with any number of people. With a digital version, we each have to have our own copy. Like, I'm starting to get why apps are cheap, priced so cheap, but this isn't priced at app prices. Yeah, no, and, and specifically with Steam. Uh, while we've spoken to say, we've spoken before that playing to... Two people playing from home has its limitations on board game arena as well. They're easily overcome at a much cheaper price yeah. than buying a new $24 video game mm -hmm. for every person. For every person. Uh, now, one, one thing I'll say about the Windows Store, when I buy a game on there, my kids can use it on another computer that I've logged in and installed it on while I use it on a, my own computer that I've logged okay. in and installed it on. So... This is this is very much a Steam limitation, um, and I'm not sure how much of it is you know the main the, the producers or production companies putting their weight on Steam. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that you have to have separate Asmodee accounts, separate from your Steam account to play, means yeah. I don't understand why they're doing this other than uh, money grab. I guess I don't know. I, I guess I don't know. Like, like there should be a a player account and a game master account type of thing. Which is how Board Game Arena works. So Board Game Arena, if one player has the premium account, whatever it's called, as a subscriber, I can't remember the term, they can invite anyone to play. So I can, as a subscriber, again, thanks Eric Franklin for the subscription to that. You're awesome. Um, 
I can launch any game on the site and invite Sean, who's not a premium player, which is a perfect way to do it. Sean doesn't need a copy, doesn't need to pay, but someone in our group does have to have paid for it. Yep. The, to me, that's a better thing. Like, I guess I get it, because if we were talking video games, you don't want everyone to play an MMO all on one person's free account, right? Like, so I get it, but like, there almost should be like a board game category or something. It's just, it's so different from the physical game. The physical game, one person in a gaming community needs to own the game, not everyone who plays it. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh... Yeah. Well, since this fell through, uh, we decided to go with Board Game Arena, but since all three of us could play at once. So we did that for our first live stream. Uh, the first game we streamed was Race for the Galaxy, just because it's something we all play together all the time. Uh, we used the, Gal the Gathering Storm expansion, which I still swear is a must-have. Once you know how to play Race for the Galaxy, use Gathering Storm. Now, while all three of us love Race and we had a solid game, it was not a good choice for streaming. Like, in my head, I was thinking we'd have the stream up and I was, we were using some new software and I would switch between players on their turns, right? Well, there's a couple reasons that doesn't work. First off, which I didn't even really consider, is in most play in Race for the Galaxy is actually simultaneous. Players are going to select their actions and then play out those actions at the same time. Now, when you're playing in person, People often take turns to see what the other players are doing, but the digital version, everyone's doing that at once. And while the other problem, which I didn't even consider, is swapping who's streaming was showing me everyone's hand, and that's not really fair. Now, knowing what cards you have or someone else has isn't everything. It is certainly a bit of an unfair advantage, uh, depending yeah. on how things deal out. Now, there are solutions to this. You can do blind switching with a Slobs app on your phone or with the Stream Deck. But it's not ideal because you want to be able to make sure things are working on the stream yeah. without worrying about seeing information you shouldn't have. Uh, so after one game of Race for the Galaxy, we're like, all right, all right, that's not going to work. Let's let's pick something that's actually turn based. And the other thing we were looking for is something with the central player board, so I could just leave the the focus of the the app we were using on my screen. That way, you just have my screen up and you don't have to keep switching between the two. Uh, that led me to Carcassonne. I guess I I really like the way Carcassonne was done on Board Game Arena. Now, again, I'd rather play it on Steam because it's way prettier, but we would have run into the same problem. But the Board Game Arena version is very functional and looks like the tile game. It's not ugly by any means. It works. Uh, while we were playing, I was tweaking Streamlabs because we were using some new software, and I was trying to make it so we could see our faces. And I got to say, by the end, I really liked the way our stream looked. With uh, I had our faces off to the side. We had the, some branding on it. I think it looked really good. You got to see us, you know, making nasty faces at each other when, well, at our cameras, when someone played a, played a, a mean tile. And, man, I got to say, we, we are cutthroat. Uh, we played a handful of games in different court configurations. Uh, yeah, we are, we are nasty Car Carcassonne players. So we started off with the base game. Uh, that went really quick because, well, the base game's quick. There's not a lot of tiles in the base game. I'm so used to playing with expansion. So then I added in Inns and Cathedrals, uh, which I think makes for a much in more interesting game. Like, that's another one. Like, always play with Inns and Cathedrals. Uh, we played a couple games with those rules. Uh, Inns and Cathedrals makes roads more valuable. That's the main thing. Plus, it just adds more tiles. But the Cathedral, take it or leave it. Um, then we played a final game of Traders and Builders, which is personally my favorite expansion for Carcassonne that's ever made. But that one had a bit of a learning curve for the other two players. Now, Deanna, it was just because she hadn't played in forever. And well, for Sean, it was your first time actually seeing that expansion. Yeah, it was interesting. I play Carcassonne all the time. I mean, there's never a time I don't have a game of Carcassonne ro rolling on board game arena with uh, three or four players at least. Uh, but no one's ever uh, popped this expansion on. And I have to say, the builders messed me up. Uh, I kept confusing it for a meeple. I, I didn't use the pig at all. And the traders aspect, I think, has less of a forceful impact as the builders. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does add a gloss of additional strategy on top of what, it, what, for us at least, was already a cutthroat strategy for city building. Yeah. What it, what, to me, what it makes, it makes you play cities cutthroat. So if you're normally, oh, just happily building your own, throwing those commodities in, you're going to end up fighting for more cities. We are already, we're fighting for every city. Yeah, so. Exactly. I, I think overall, we had a lot of fun playing. Um, I personally spent a lot of time fighting with Streamlabs and um, the conferencing software. Something called Jitsi, which actually, if you do conferencing with lots of people, I so far we recommend it. We haven't done a lot of work with Jitsi, but 
like I think was it twelve people or something ridiculous like that. It can handle video chat. Uh, it can do actually. In theory, it's supposed to be able to handle thirty people. Thirty Jesus. Uh, without without uh, you know bogging down. So yeah. we'll, so hopefully we won't need to went. see that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, software we may be using if we do interviews in the future. If I ever want run an RPG, definitely going to be. Low. If you were a fan of Google Hangouts, this looks like it might be a good alternative. Yeah. Uh, by the time we finish the stream, I think it looked pretty good. So our next stream later this week, tomorrow, for those of you here live, um, uh, and well, t- two days from now for those of you listening on the podcast, but that won't be our next time. It'll be the time after. Uh, it should look a lot more sti- better, uh, a lot more stable. I think I figured out the tab thing. Streamlabs is doing some really weird stuff with window focus. I think we got it all figured out. Uh, another one other interesting thing that, that may actually mean you have uh, more issues next time, uh, Streamlabs has just announced that they have some sort of browser integration now. So you can actually use the browser in the Streamlabs window and not have to use a separate tab for, but, you know, who knows? Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Famous last words. Now, the other thing we are doing, um, I didn't announce this anywhere. We have, thanks to our Patreon patrons, which we'll get to some specific ones later, we have uh, wired up the house. It, though it, that sounds fancier than it is because <laughs> all we did was buy lots of cable and it's running around the house. So, like, now I have cable that kind of goes around the room right now and Deanna's now wired. And when we stream our Gloomhaven games on Friday, that'll now be wired. And I think that made a big difference for the stream. Yeah. So, uh <sighs> Hopefully the struggles with net network stability have uh, at least been reduced and uh, we'll get there. So besides the games we live streamed on Thursday, now the three of us, as I said, have been playing a lot of games on Board Game Arena. And one I thought was worth talking about now that we've actually finished a couple games is Through the Ages. Uh, this is the new edition, a new story of civilization from Czech Games Arena. One of... I, I wouldn't even say one of the best civilization building game ever produced. Uh, if you want to play a Sid Meier civilization where you're not doing the map part, that's this game. It's everything without the map. Uh, learning to play this game on board game arena. It, no, just don't uh, like ridiculous learning per climb. Like Sean, who had never played the physical game. I felt sorry for I played the physical game and I'm like, Whoa, I, I thought I knew how to play this game. Uh, like the board game implementation, board game arena is is done rather well, but just little indie idiosyncrasies of the interface and where different information is presented and what some of the information means. Wow, um, I gotta say though, one lifesaver is that this game has an undo function, which everything on board game arena should have an undo function. So when you do mess something up, you can usually recover from your mistake. Now, unfortunately, it undoes everything you've done that turn, so yeah. you have to remember. But on the other hand, I've actually really been grateful for this on our longer plays because there are times when I've realized, oh, wait, I've done something in the wrong order. Mm-hmm. And now at the very end, I've got, I'm, you know, I'm going to have some horrible effect at the end of my turn if I pass because the second thing I did was with the wrong card. Yeah. Um, so I've been very grateful of this, this replayability and uh, it's it's wonderful. Yeah, to be honest, I think the reason it's there is that's actually a rule in the rule book. Because the game is that heavy, there are that many decisions and that many decision points and that many outcomes, right? You're like, okay, well, I'm just going to get another worker and spend my food to do that. Then I'm going to use that work to increase this. Then I'm going to increase that. And then when I do that, I'm going to get the, oh, shoot. Now I'm going to have spoilage because I've not used up all my food and I don't want to have spoilage because that's minus point. Okay, undo. Wait, let's try again, right? Like, that is literally how the game's played in real life as well. Yeah, there's a couple of times, uh, and, and every once in a while, I'm still messing up some of the language on cards. Um, mm. So I, I keep forgetting that upgrade is upgrading a citizen, not yeah, upgrading move. a card level. So yeah. and I, every once in a while, I keep messing that up. So I'll have, I'll have been playing, expecting to play my upgrade card when I upgrade this building. But oh, wait, no, upgrade means upgrading a citizen a level, yes. not upgrading a building a level. And, and so little little details in mm-hmm. the language like that can catch you off. And again, really make you grateful for that undo for that, button. Yeah, thank you for the undo button. Um, uh, so yeah. So it- at this point, we played a bunch of basic games, and actually, we just finished our first full game with the full three eras, all the war rules, and everything else. Holy cow. 
Um, I got to say, don't learn through the ages through Board Game Arena. Just don't. Uh, if you do play it, though, make sure you start with the basic rules. The basic rules are much more forgiving. Uh, basically, they become a point salad. You score everything. Uh, whereas in the advanced rule, you only score what seeded is added to your culture. So that's a huge difference in what you're trying to do. But basically, you want to play the basic game a bunch of times, times to teach you how to build an engine so that your empire is generating culture. Because that's the whole goal of the game is to generate culture. Don't jump right into the advanced game. Uh, but again, watch some, I think Sean, I got the Rado video was the one he yeah. used. Um, watch some videos, read the rule book, read the PDF. Don't try to go with the board gaming arena rules, but if you already know how to play, I got to say, it's a great way to play through the ages. Now, again, I heard there's a great steam version, but, uh, sorry, steam, you're being silly about licensing. Yeah. So make sure you check out some of those great options for word game teaching on YouTube. Again, I use Rado. Some people like, some people don't. Uh, there's so many options out there. I'm not even going to necessarily uh, mm. recommend anyone in particular, but use them. Uh, my, my first recommendation would be to have that PDF of the rules open in front of you as they're playing along and things just start to make more sense. Uh, you're going to crash and burn the first time through. Uh, <laughs> I'm still not sure how I scored what I did on the last game we finished. <laughs> I thought I was like 25 points less than that. Um, so again, the scoring point, I, the scoring, I still don't really understand, but I do understand what I'm aiming for. I know, mm -hmm. you know, I knew I wasn't going to win because I didn't have enough of X. I just yeah. didn't understand why I didn't lose by more. That's all. <laughs> there you go. Uh, one tip. If you do watch Rado's videos in particular, turn on subtitles in Klingon. I don't, sounds like a weird tip, but that's actually where he puts all of his corrections if he makes a mistake while doing a video. So the final game I want to talk about, it's another board game arena game, and that is King Domino. I broke this out on Friday last week after our stream, thinking this might be another game that would be good to live stream. Now, at this point, I've played a handful of games, and I'm impressed by what I've seen. The game looks great. The BGA interface is perfect for what it is. And I'm pleased to say that a bunch of the rule variants are included, like the Middle Kingdom rules where you get bonus points if you finish the game with your castle in the center. It's it's a really well-implemented version. Uh, Sean and I just started a game, so he hasn't even gotten to experience a full one yet. Have we started a game yet? I don't even know. Yeah, I, I, got, the, I got to pick my first tile. So you oh, okay. Must <laughs> like I, haven't, I haven't gotten to that yet. That might be uh, coming up next then. There you go. Uh, now, I got to say, I'm not sure if it's going to be good for streaming because the problem is the board, the way they lay out the thing, you can only see one player's kingdom screen at a time. So this might be one where we could try out the whole switching because it doesn't matter if I see your kingdom. Everything's open information. So this might be one where I can actually switch this, the focus between the three of us, but we're not going to be able to just stream my front, my, my screen only. You'd only see my kingdom or I'd have to scroll down and keep scrolling back and forth to show everyone's kingdom. I don't think it'll work. Um, but like I said, it's nice because there's no hidden information, so everything's open. So it might work for streaming, but just for playing, I gotta say it's good. Like Deanna and I have probably finished six games already because it's King Domino. You finish in like if you were playing real time, you probably finish in six minutes. Right. Yeah, and I've played King Domino. King Domino, I, I do enjoy. So looking forward to that. So looking ahead, what have uh, you got planned for the coming week? <laughs> There is a Japanese-made culture-based card game I need to get some plays in. Um, you'll be seeing a review of that hitting either later this week or next week. I'm thinking next week at this point. Uh, no public play gaming event this week, but for those of you listening on the podcast, I am going to be at the CG Realm on September 14th, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, we were hoping to do a Dead Man's Cabal demo night. But as far as I can tell, the store hasn't been able to get copies in yet. Like, I know this one's still getting out to Kickstarter backers. So if it's not Dead, Kim, Dead Man's Cabal, I'm not sure what the feature game of the night will be, but I'll be bringing out some board games. I'm really looking forward to playing Horizons 5 players. And I recorded a ton of unboxing videos the other day, eight of them. And I am really looking forward to playing some of the games. So in that pile is uh, Eminent Domain, two expansions for that. Gold West, um, I don't even remember everything I unboxed now. Cool. There was a whole bunch. I'm trying to think of the one I most wanted to play. Imhotep's the one I, I most want to play. Open Ashley. Maybe get in a play this weekend. All right. And now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Sean P. Kelly from the Excellent Gaming and BS podcast. Thank you. 
Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Roger Malash, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website, tabletopbellhop.com, for more gaming content. And if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers in YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. You can also catch the Tabletop Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30, where we play mostly play Gloomhaven, but now, now and then we'll surprise you with something else. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. And our new tradition of raiding another tabletop gaming Twitch streamer at the end of the night. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>